people have to live in, in unity. We are still in transition. Civil society has been decimated. Of course we rely on media. And I think the government has not done enough. The international community has failed to respond. No place in the world is perfect. Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Blast at mosque near Kabul killed several Afghan worshippers. Indian security forces in Kashmir neutralized two al Badr terrorists in encounter. And ahead of FATF review, Pakistan announces new measures on terror financing. Violence, including attacks on civilians, has increased in Afghanistan even as the United States has begun an operation to withdraw all its remaining troops over the next four months. Both the Taliban and the government routinely blame each other for attacks. The attackers are rarely identified and the public is seldom informed of the results of investigations into the many attacks in the capital. Recently, several Afghan worshippers were killed in a blast at mosque near Kabul. A report. A bomb ripped through a mosque in Kabul during Friday prayers, killing 12 worshippers, including the Imam. A further 15 people were wounded, including at least one child in the explosion, which happened in Shakar Dara district in the north of the capital. The blast happened on the second of a three-day ceasefire announced by the Taliban to mark the Muslim holiday Eid al-Fitr. It came less than a week after scores of people, mainly students, were killed in explosions outside a school in Kabul. The attack and the latest in a surge in violence as US and NATO troops begin their final withdrawal from the war-torn country after two decades of conflict. <laughs> There are apprehensions that the withdrawal of foreign troops would nevertheless not end fighting in Afghanistan but would cause a drawn-out civil war. Several reports have suggested that since the United States signed a troop withdrawal deal with the Taliban last year that called for a reduction in violence by all sides, attacks by the insurgent group have escalated. Hence, President Ashraf Ghani recently mentioned that the Afghan government is ready to fight against the Taliban after the full withdrawal of foreign troops from the country. If they do not want peace and want to gain power to violence and impose a, regime, a dictatorial regime, then the patri all the patriotic forces of Afghanistan would have to rally and make a decision. And that issue, unfortunately, would have to be decided on the field of battle. For the Afghans who are going through tough times due to upsticks in tedious violence and also scrambling with uncertain future, there is a lot of accusations of the US over its failure to make a good deal. As the security situation is getting worse, the finger pointing on the US has already begun. However, Washington has assured that the U.S. will maintain assets in the region and works with Afghan counterparts will continue. Moreover, President Ghani has reiterated that the Afghan government will continue to work with the U.S. and the NATO allies for peace efforts. The threat of terrorism is changed. It has not disappeared. We are all agreed on this. Two, the United States is committed to supporting, providing support, this is financial, in the security area, in the economic area, in the humanitarian area, because the United States fortunately shares the values of supporting the gains of the last 20 years, and our discussion is enormously productive. The same fortunately applies to NATO members and non-NATO members who have been our partners. Many critics believe that leaving Afghanistan without uprooting all terrorist organizations or restoring peace, the U.S. actually is trying to find a way of safe passage for their troops. Considering the ground reality, 
all the mess and ruins have been left on the shoulder of Afghanistan. But if regional countries honestly support the Afghan government, this challenge could be turned into opportunity to reap up terrorism in all of its manifestations. In January this year, the National Investigation Agency filed a charge sheet against Jammu and Kashmir police officer Davinder Singh, who was arrested over his links with separatist militants. Davinder was ferrying terrorists of the band Hezbollah Mujahideen to a Jammu from Kashmir. Continuing with their policy of zero tolerance against anti-India forces, Jammu and Kashmir government recently sacked him. We take a look. Disgraced police officer Davinder Singh, who was arrested and charged by the NIA in a terror case, was on recently dismissed by the Jammu and Kashmir administration. Singh was arrested in January last year when he was ferrying terrorists of the banned Hezbollah Mujahideen to Jammu from Kashmir. The case was investigated by the National Investigation Agency, who filed a charge sheet against Singh and others. Lieutenant General Manoj Sinha ordered Singh's dismissal from service with immediate effect under Article 311 of the Constitution. According to the NIA charge sheet filed before a special court in Jammu last year, Singh, who was posted in the sensitive anti-hijacking unit of Jammu and Kashmir Police, had been in constant touch with the handlers in the Pakistan High Commission, who have since been repatriated to Islamabad. It is learnt that SP Devinder Singh has been charged by NIA for transshipping the terrorists and the weapons. Now, he being such a responsible officer, a senior police officer who has held sensitive appointments, uh, his being dismissed from service, I think, is not good enough punishment. For an offence like waging war against the state, wherein he has helped the terrorist and uh, his, those weapons would have been used against innocent people or security forces. For such a crime, I think it should be an exemplary punishment. Continuing with their policy of zero tolerance against secessionist forces, government in Jammu and Kashmir has constituted a special task force to identify and act tough against government employees involved in anti-India activities. To tighten news against employees waging war against India, STF headed by Additional Director General of Police has been assigned the task of speedily scrutinizing and screening such cases in a time-bound manner. Recently, National Investigation Agency arrested Altaf Ahmed Radar, a government school teacher from the Bandipura area in North Kashmir, for radicalizing, motivating and brainwashing youngsters to wage violent jihad against India. He was associated with pan-Islamic terror outfit lashkar e taiba and his job was to lure youngsters to gun culture and recruit them into terror ranks. Gone are those days when terror was incentivized and there used to be a premium on separatism in strip on Jammu and Kashmir. It is learnt that Jammu and Kashmir government is making a special task force to identify and scrutinize the government employees uh, who are involved in the, anti, in the terror activities and supporting the terrorists. I think it's a very good step and such people must be identified and booked under the law and must be given exemplary punishments. We also need to strengthen our laws to make sure that such people are punished harshly. Indian security forces have successfully managed to burst various strategies of terror in Kashmir. However, despite the best efforts of the security forces, some challenges still remain. The biggest challenge ahead is to gradually dismantle all support and sympathy for Pakistan-based terror group in the valley. This would be the final phase of counter-insurgency operations, one that would need more time and sustained efforts. financing radicalizing innocent youths into jihad 
and launching violent attacks on civilians and security forces have topped Pakistan's list of priorities when it comes to its unwarranted policy on Kashmir. However, to its major disappointment, the alert Indian security forces have been able to foil all their attempts by busting deep terror networks of Pakistan and eliminating and arresting top commanders of terrorist groups in Kashmir region. Recently, two al Badr terrorists were killed in an encounter with security forces in the valley. Indian security forces recently killed two terrorists in an encounter at Konmo on the outskirts of Srinagar. According to the police, the killed terrorists identified as Mudasir Khande and were seen Bashir Pandit belonged to the Al Badr outfit and were residents of Pulwama district. As per records, the slain duo were part of groups involved in several terror crimes, including planning and executing of attacks on police and security forces. Recently, security forces in the valley also detected and neutralized an improvised explosive device following inputs about a terror attack in Shopia district. With such successful operations one after another, the entire ecosystem of terrorists across the Kashmir Valley has come to a standstill. Shinagar police were told that in the Khunmu area, there were two terrorists. The two police were further developed. After that, the army, CRP, police were put in the cordon. And today, in the morning, the fighting started. The police had not done a lot of appeal. Then, in the encounter, two local terrorists were killed. Pakistan seems to be frustrated with the crackdown on terror. Hence, Pak-backed terror groups like Al Badr are continuously attempting to disrupt peace in the valley. The Al Badr terrorist outfit was proscribed by the government of India in the year 2002. Headquartered in Mansera in Pakistan, the outfit has claimed responsibility for several terrorist attacks in Jammu and Kashmir. Last year, it came to light that this long-defunct terror group was revived again by Pakistan to disrupt peace in the Union territory. In the past, the outfit has launched attacks targeting Indian military installations and prominent government officials. Closely linked with Pakistan's Inter-Services Intelligence or ISI, Al Badr is one of the several Pak-backed jihadi groups involved in disrupting communal harmony in Jammu and Kashmir. Pakistan ISI has reactivated Al Badr. Because Al Badr's avowed state is, state is that it is opposed to any peaceful negotiations between India and Pakistan regarding Kashmir, and it has vowed to fight for the liberation of Kashmir. Therefore, it is a militant organization which does not believe in negotiation and is only hardline one which believes only in creating and spreading terror through the power of the gun. Therefore, now Pakistan ISI has found that this organization would be most suited since all the others are now lying defunct because of the action of the Indian security forces and the people of Kashmir Valley who have now stood up against these militants. Pakistan has always sought with varying degrees of intensity to destabilize India, rack its unity and challenge its integrity. This approach is unlikely to change. Now terrorist groups backed by ISI and Pakistan Army have adopted a new modus operandi to foil terror strikes in the peaceful region of Jammu and Kashmir. But Indian security forces are always vigilant, alert and capable of giving a befitting reply. Islamabad should understand that any move to repeat Pulwama or any attempt to challenge India's integrity will be disastrous for it. Pakistan needs to make a hard choice now. Find peace with India or blunder into an escalatory cycle. Low-cost options are over. Pakistan has always tried to deceive the FATF task force by pretending to take action against internationally designated terrorist groups and their financial networks. Ahead of FATF's virtual plenary meeting during June 21st to 25th, the Pakistan government has approved new rules for the forfeiture and auction of properties and assets related to anti-money laundering cases. However, the observers have termed it a farce. We have a report. With a little more than a month to go for a review of Pakistan's counter-terror financing regime, 
by the Financial Action Task Force, Islamabad has put measures in place to ensure such offences are investigated by specialised agencies. However, the observers have termed it a farce. They call it Islamabad's tactical move aimed at building up its case before the Financial Action Task Force that has kept it in its grey list since 2018. The FATF placed Pakistan into grey list of countries with deficiencies into anti-grey laundering and combating of financing terrorism laws in June 2018 after giving 27 action plans for the country to come out from the list within one year. Amid COVID-19, Pakistan was granted extension and now the fresh deadline is next month. Pakistan is under FATF grey list for last three years. It has been trying hard to get out of the grey list. It has fulfilled a number of conditions which have been laid down by the FATF. There are still very important four restrictions which continue. Now Pakistan has tried to enforce a regulation and create authorities for specifically charging and trying those under the Anti-Money Money Laundering Act. This is not likely to satisfy the FATF. This is purely window dressing and providing some shelter, in fact, to those who are carrying blatant anti-money laundering activities in the country. Islamabad has been facing a multiplying global pressure to crack down on the terrorists who are expanding their bases in the country and launching attacks on other countries. Several review meetings of the FATF are scheduled to begin in the second week of June, culminating in the next FATF plenary between June 21 and 25. However, Pakistan may seek more time to complete the last three actions it has to take to exit the Financial Action Task Force grey list, citing delays amid the pandemic and capacity constraints. Recently, Pakistan revealed this in its submission to the International Monetary Fund. But IMF has warned that failures to meet objectives, including those related to the action plan with the FATF, could hamper external financing and investment. Despite being grey-listed time and again, Pakistan is not effectively complying with FATF recommendations. The reason lies in its experience in manipulating and hoodwinking the FATF system, in particular an international community in general. Hence, Pakistan continues to remain a safe haven to dreaded terrorists. These terrorists and their outfits not only operate freely but enjoy patronage of the Pakistan army and secret agencies. Jaisha Mohammed Chief Masood Azhar and lashkar e head Hafiz Saeed are two terrorist leaders who are under the UN sanctions list for some time now. Pakistan has failed to take action against both of them. Whatever is, is being done against Hafiz Saeed is just whitewash. In fact, this is essentially to provide him shelter by giving him cover of the state in the so-called jail, where he is enjoying all the privileges uh, which he could outside. Masood Azhar, in fact, is nowhere on the uh, list of being actioned against by the state. He is enjoying a free life on the, an alleged plea that he is not well and requires medical attention. So there is just no scrutiny on Pakistan, what action Pakistan is taking against the terrorist leaders, which has been demanded not just by India, but by the United Nations. Whenever some kind of international pressure builds up, Islamabad comes up with announcements of new measures on terror crackdown. Pakistan is deceiving the world on terror funding, hence FATF Grillis needs to go darker. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We will be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsc at anin.com. This is Karim Zemek signing off on the behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.